Right, hey guys, welcome back um, to History Part 2. My name is Ivan, and today I'm going to be your tutor for History Part 2, where we're going to be covering essentially paper number one. Uh, so what we did in last time's video is basically covered half of paper one. We covered question number one and question number two. We covered all tips and tricks that I could give you for how to answer those questions, the fundamentals of paper one, how it's different from papers two and paper three. And overall, we had a fantastic session. So what we're going to do today is basically cover questions three and four. So this is the next part, basically the, ne the next part of paper one. So what we're going to do is show you all the tips and tricks that you can have up your sleeve on the IB exams to basically score really high on this paper. And we're going to do it in the easy way. Cool. So I'm really excited to bring this to you guys. And without further ado, let's get started. So the first one we're going to cover is question number three. So question number three is worth six marks. So, so far, if you remember from last time um, when we covered paper one, we covered question one and two, and those were worth five points and four points respectively. So this time we have a question that's worth six marks, which is the highest amount of marks for a question that we've had so far. So obviously it's going to be more demanding. So what this question is going to ask you guys to do is basically compare and contrast or just compare or just contrast two sources. These can be any of the four sources which you're asked to analyze on paper one. So pay close attention to which sources you're asked to actually compare and contrast. Right. So what do you need to do here? Well, in order to score high, unlike the previous questions, number one and two, where the points were, uh, it was okay for your points to be slightly more superficial with less explanation and basically a lot more direct. Here, you're expected to do a little bit more because you have a higher sort of grade boundary for the amount of marks that you can achieve. What that means is that each point needs to not only be valid and correct, but it also has to be explained. What that means is that here you have to give evidence. So if you say that there is a comparison or a similarity between two sources, you have to give evidence such as a direct quotation or a paraphrase from each source. Um, a very important thing here to mention as well is the fact that your ideas, the ideas and the arguments you're presenting have to be balanced. What that means is you have to have an equal number of comparisons and an equal number of contrasts if you're asked to do both. And since the question is worth six marks, that means that you need to have free contrast and free comparisons in order to score all six points. Now, in terms of breaking this question down, um, like I said, it's a little bit more, I guess, lengthy and demanding than the previous questions, but it really isn't difficult if you break it down. So what I mean of this is let's take a look at the step by step process, which we've been doing so far and sort of see how this question can turn from difficult to very easy. Now, the first thing you have to do to score high on this question is to understand what the question wants you to compare and contrast. This is important because you get four sources in this paper one and every single source gives quite a lot of information. Um, however, typically all the questions leading up to question four, one, two, and three ask you about very specific things. And what this means is that you should not be focusing on comparing and contrasting ideas, which they don't want you to compare and contrast. The one good thing about the IB is that their criteria is very specific. So if they ask you to do one thing and you do just that one thing, you will score full marks. You don't want to do more or less work than you're expected to do. Now, once you've analyzed and sort of understood what exactly you're going to compare and contrast, what idea, you need to find six total points of comparison and contrast. However, here's a really important tip that I always give to all my students. Um, you have to pay close attention to whether the question is compare and contrast or just compare or just contrast. Because if you're asked to compare and contrast two sources, you need three of each to score full points. If you're asked to only compare or only contrast, you need six points um, of the one that you're asked to do in order to score four marks, uh, six marks. So um, yeah, cool. That's it basically for now. So the third and final step in this process that I want to give you guys is basically you have to not only understand, of course, and sort of read the source and accumulate that information, but you have to actually write it in a manner which is easy to follow. Now, this is especially important for this question because it's more lengthy. There's more analysis and writing you're going to have to do. So you want to make sure that you explain your ideas in a running order. A running order simply refers to having all the similarities together, or all the contrasts together and not mixing them up. So not having one similarity, one contrast, two contrasts, one similarity, one similarity, stuff like that. You either you want to have three similarities and three contrasts immediately after each other and don't mix them up because that's going to make it difficult for the examiner to grade and it's just not ideal. Um, right, okay, so moving on to an actual example. Now we're going to be using example question three from the move to global war, um, which we have been using so far. We're going to be using the May 2019 paper for this example as well. Now the question states the following, compare and contrast, so both things, what sources K and L reveal about the attitudes towards German foreign policy under Hitler. So what should we do here? Let's take a look. The question is asking you to essentially compare and contrast the views uh, of sources K and L. So how do sources K and L view the attitudes? 
so the way that people reacted to German foreign policy. So basically, what are sources KNL saying about the way that people or countries or the international community basically reacted to German foreign policy? What did they do? What is the source telling us about that? And here's the important thing. This is the thing you're going to compare and contrast the attitudes of those countries or people, nothing else. You're not going to be comparing and contrasting um, how good the sources think German foreign policy was or how successful. You're comparing and contrasting what people felt about German foreign policy. How did they react to it? What were their attitudes? So that's the key theme here. Um, so what you need to do here is find free comparisons and free contrast between the two sources in terms of how uh, their views are similar or different, right? So compare and contrast between, um, yeah, between the two sources about German attitudes. Cool, so that's what you're gonna be doing. Um, and it's also important, of course, like I said, to state them clearly in a running order. So I'm gonna show you how to do that now in practice. So let's get on with it. Right, okay, so what's the first thing we always wanna do? We wanna take a look at how to analyze the source. And in this case, I strongly recommend using some sort of, uh, not a highlighter, but rather using some sort of pen or just underlining your source and sort of analyzing the source and really getting to know the source. So being familiar with what's happening in it. What's the information that's being given to you? So what I've done here is I'm gonna sort of show you the comparisons and contrast I found in these sources. And just for time efficiency, I'm gonna show you one comparison and one contrast. But of course, you, I would like you to apply sort of the same technique if you're going to be doing this for more points as you will on the actual exams. So the first thing I've done here is I've highlighted the green section in this in source K, which says Hitler's quest to rearm Germany continued unopposed. So what the source is saying is that Hitler's quest to rearm Germany, Germany to, re, to achieve rearmament was unopposed. So people couldn't stop him. And that's a similarity with source L, because here, if you look at the very bottom, it says, it was nevertheless obvious that by his bold initiative, Hitler had scored an amazing success, which also strengthened his prestige in Germany. So here we are told that Hitler scored an amazing success, um, and it was obvious that he, that he was going to do this, basically. So what this is telling us is also that he was able to do whatever he wanted, basically. Uh, the, the opposition to his ideas and actions were, was not sufficient. So that's one similarity and one comparison for, for sure. Now, if we go back and look at a one sec like this, right, so source K. So what's a contrast? Well, the contrast is in yellow. It says, during Anglo-French talks in London at the beginning of February 1935, Germany's rearmament had received the blessing of the two West European powers. So what this is saying here is that the two West European powers, in this case referring to Britain and France, um, blessed Germany or told her that it's okay to rearm. However, this idea is contrasted pretty starkly with the next source where we have the sentence uh, as follows. Confronted by the German desire for naval, re naval rearmament, England, Britain, after a brief suggestion of displeasure, quickly decided to come to terms. Now, the key thing here is the fact that it says that they were, um, they had a sense of displeasure. They were not happy. So they didn't want this. So what the first source is telling us is that both countries blessed Germany. They were okay with her rearming. This source is now actually bringing a new fact to the sort of to the light, telling us that Britain was displeased with this. Okay, so that's a contrast in terms of the, the sources and how they present what um, the Britons felt about Germany's rearmament. So those are two ideas which are compared and contrasted. Now, in terms of how to actually answer and sort of put this together, we're going to use the following tactics. So for similarities, I want you to use some key words which make it clear to the examiner that you're comparing, not contrasting. So here's how I would answer this, and this is what I recommend you do as well. Right, so one similarity between source K and L is that both sources, so the key word here is both, right? You want to use the key word such as both to imply that you're comparing a similarity between the two sources. View German foreign policy as blank space. So here is where you would take one of those green points that I made earlier, one of the highlights, and sort of put them in here. So basically rewrite and quote them to provide sort of evidence. You can also do the following then. This can be seen in that source K states that, take another quotation from source K where it explicitly states that particular point, and source D similarly states that, and take a direct quote from source L. Finally, you want to round this up uh, by saying this shows that both sources view German foreign policy as, and then you summarize it using the words, for example, view it as successful or view it as um, Right, that it could go on unopposed, which is one of the examples here, right? It could, German foreign policy was unopposed, basically. That's what the sources are saying. Now, the keywords here are both view, similarly, and similarity. Now, in terms of contrast, it's the same thing, but you want to use different words. So here you want to use contrast. So we say one contrast between the views of sources K and L on German foreign policy is that source K states, put a quotation to exemplify what you're saying here. So this is the evidence, basically. Whereas, so this is the contrast here, you're distinguishing between the two sources. 
where source L states that and then you say something different, right? So in this case, you present that one source says that the countries France and Britain were aligned in terms of their opinion on rearmament and the other one says that Britain was not happy with it and they disagreed to it initially. This shows that source K views German foreign policy as, you explain, so you're just summarizing your own words, what, what the quotation actually means, whereas source L views it as blah, 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 etc. right? So you, you do the same thing, basically. As you can see here, the key word that you want to use is a contrast, views, and whereas. Those are the key words which distinguish two sources from one another. So this is what I recommend you do, and you want to find free similarities and free contrasts and basically answer them in like this, in triplets. So, yeah. This is essentially the idea that I wanted to show you how of how to in terms of uh, organizing your question, how to do that well and sort of in a running order. Right. OK, so the summary for this question is the following. Let's take a look. Right. So first, you have to understand the mark distribution well. Right. So don't write 10 comparisons and 10 contrasts. Write only three of each. Don't write more. Don't write six of each as well. Just write three of each. Or if you have one of them, write six of that one. Um, don't waste your time. Don't write too little, but also don't write too much. Also remember that in order for you to score a point for a, for a comparison or a contrast, you have to not only state the comparisons, not only say that they're similar, but explain, right? Give evidence, show how. Finally, you want to make sure you're writing each and every argument as a separate paragraph. So you have three paragraphs with three similarities, and a paragraph in this case is just one or two sentences, right? But I want uh, it's very efficient and sort of useful for you to have them separately here, not only for your own sake in terms of not confusing yourself in the exam, but also for the examiner to make it easy to follow. So write them in triplets, write three paragraphs with three similarities, one in each, and then three contrasts, so three paragraphs with one contrast in each afterwards, in triplets basically. Also spend no more than 15 minutes on this question because the reality is that the next question, as I'm going to show you now, is worth a lot more marks and you want to sort of um, spend more time there to maximize your score on this exam. And lastly, if it takes longer, I really recommend just moving on to the last question because, like I said, it's worth the most points. So if you can't answer this in 15 minutes or less, it's just better to get the points that you can and then move on to the next question, which is worth the most. So yeah, those are the sort of the conclusions that I can give you and the tips and tricks for question number three. And the final one we're going to take a look at when we wrap up is question four. So as Dr. Strange says, we're in the end game now, right? Because this question is worth nine marks and it's the hardest and sort of most daunting, scary kind of question, uh, but it really isn't. And I'm going to show you why. Right. So this is the last question in paper one. It gives you the most marks, nine marks. So it's a lot. Therefore, what you want to do here is just purely mathematically speaking, because it's worth the most marks, you want to have the most time for this, right? You want to make sure that you have the most time per mark that you possibly can. So uh, what I recommend doing here is basically having something like 25 to 30 minutes, um, which I'm going to bring up again later for this question. Um, and that's because this is essentially a mini paper two or paper three question. So it's an essay basically, right? So what I'm going to do is show you some tips and tricks for how to approach this question. Now, unlike the other questions here, you want to write a full essay. Like I said, so you need a body paragraph. You need three or four body paragraphs in your introduction. You need a conclusion. You don't just want to have random points floating around in no particular order like some of the previous questions. Right, so let's break this down. Well, how do you answer this question step by step? So first, the thing that I always tell my students here is that there is no specific distribution for the points. Just like in paper two and paper three, which we're going to cover in the next YouTube guide video, it's an essay, right? It's a holistic evaluation, which the examiner does. So he reads the essay and gives you an overall mark. He can't really nitpick specific areas where he says, this is why I dropped a mark. This is why this is that, or he can, but definitely not to the same extent as the other questions, which have a rigid and very regulated criteria in terms of what you can write and what you can't write. Um, in order to get nine points, it's also important to note that you need to use both your own knowledge and source material. So what this means is like, um, if this question that I, if this paper one that I just presented to you, which is about um, Germany's aggression in the 1930s and 40s, um, you will have studied that if you studied European history as well. So what you're going to do is use the source material and your own knowledge you have from class to write this essay. And I'm going to show you how to do that. So if you don't do this, it's important to note that you can't score nine points. Even if you write the best essay in the world, the best essay the examiner has ever seen, because of the criteria, you won't be able to score full marks unless you have both own knowledge and sources. This is what the IB Mark schemes for past paper ones have said, and this is the direct quotation. So what they say is, while it is expected that there will be coverage of at least two of the sources, candidates are not required to refer to all four sources in their responses. So what does this mean? Let's break it down. You need to have at least two. So if you don't, if you have less than two sources in your essay, you can't score nine marks. You'll probably be capped somewhere around six or seven, if not lower. 
Um, however, you're also not required to use all four. So in my opinion, the thing I always tell my students here is that you should strive to use free sources. If you can use free sources, you're really showing knowledge of the if you can use four, that's great, right? But don't try to force the sources into your essay if you can't use them. But do try to have two or three. So if the fourth one doesn't really fit in, don't bother, right? But make sure that you can use at least two and preferably three if possible. Right, so let's look at an example. Now, this example question for us once again from May 2019, the prescribed subject moved to global war. So the question states the following. Using the sources and your own knowledge, this is the clause that's always in front of any paper one, regardless of what topic or region you're studying. Discuss the effectiveness of the international response to German aggression between 1933 and 1938, and it's worth nine points. So let's break this down. What do we need to do? Well, we need to discuss, right? That's the key term here. So this is the command term we have to use. The effectiveness, the effectiveness of something. What is that something? The effectiveness of the international response to German aggression, right? Between 1933 and 38. And the important thing here is to not talk about German aggression outside of this time frame. So you need to find arguments and discuss the effectiveness of the international response to Germany between these years, basically. Now, the way you want to do this is in two different uh, approaches, and I'm going to teach those to you now. So there are two approaches. So the first is to lead with the source material. So let's say you encounter a paper one where you really understand the sources um, and you really like them. However, your own knowledge from class is just lacking in that area for whatever reason. Maybe you fell asleep in class, right? You can never know. The point is that here, if that's the situation, you focus on using the sources as the main source of information for your para for your paragraphs and your essays. So you start your each paragraph with a source and then you sort of sprinkle or add a little bit of own knowledge just to fill in the criteria. The second situation is where the sources suck, you don't understand them, but you know a lot about, for example, Germany's rearmament and Hitler's aggression in the 1930s. Then you focus on your own knowledge. So you start each paragraph with your own knowledge and back it up with some sources by maybe putting, a, oh yeah, by the way, this is also stated in source I and source K. You don't really explain it, you just have it there to fulfill the criteria. So what I wanna highlight here, and the thing I always tell my students is that these are equally suitable. Using each one doesn't matter, uh, doesn't sort of change how many points you can get. It's important to know which one is most beneficial for you. So you need to analyze if you understand the sources or not, and then choose off of that. So yeah, these are the two scenarios. If you lack personal knowledge but have good sources, use approach one. If you have lots of personal knowledge in the area but have hard to understand sources, use approach two. Now, in terms of actually writing the essay, I want to highlight that we're going to be covering that in part three for the history tutorial series where we're going to cover paper two and three. Now here I wanted to show you an approach to actually the way that you want to formulate your essay, but the actual essay writing skills and fundamentals we're going to be covering in guide number three, where we're going to cover essay writing as a whole, how to write paper two and paper three, and you can go ahead and watch that as well if you want to actually learn how to write a mini paper two essay for this, because this question is the exact same thing. It's an essay, just shorter. So a summary of this whole thing is the following. Write a paper two or three uh, style essay, but make it shorter. Spend no less than 25 minutes because it's worth the most points and it gives you a lot of freedom for how you can score your points, right? It's not, it's not graded in a specific way, it's just an essay. So write a good essay and you can score high. In terms of actually writing this question, paragraph by paragraph, how to structure your introduction all the way through to your conclusion, refer to Lanterna's History Paper 2 and Free Guide, which teaches you the fundamentals of essay writing. We'll be uploading that really soon as well. So that's it from me. And what I want to end off with is saying that if this is interesting to you and you think you want to learn even more, go ahead and go to lanterneducation.com. It's our online website where we have a lot of free resources for history and many other subjects. And we also have a service called online private tuition, whereby you can have one-on-one -on -one tuition with, through Skype or Zoom or any other application with me, for example, or any other Lanterna tutors. And we can go ahead and help you out with anything, practice, uh, practice papers, IAs, um, essays, anything you really want. And so, yeah, that's it from me. And I hope you have a great day ahead and I'll see you for the next video part three. Bye.